So let's talk about Uganda, which is among the three East African economies currently facing shortage of petrol products in the wake of a surge in global oil prices and Russia's war on Ukraine. But there is more to Uganda's socioeconomic problems. Uh, joining me to discuss the latest developments with insights on what lies ahead for the country is Joseph Ocheno. Ocheno is an international journalist and a political economist based in Kampala. Thank you for making it on the show tonight. Uh, let's start with the big story around the fuel uh, situation. What is the latest on the ground right now in Kampala and around the country? Awesome. It's uh, been a, a difficult last several weeks, perhaps leading to months in fact since January. Uh, but uh, fuel prices in Uganda and fuel shortage for various reasons, some of them political, others structural, others basically incompetence. But the latest is that uh, while some fuel is there at the pumps, the prices remain very, very high. In fact, the average difference is up to 600 Ugandan shillings equivalent. You know, that is more than twice the amount of profit uh, uh, an average pump owner uh, would make uh, from selling a litre of fuel. So extremely expensive. But beyond that also, I think Ugandans find it rather strange uh, that there is no war. Uh, Kenya is our neighbour, we're an East African community, and there is shortage when there is actually no crisis in Kenya. Um, so um, more recently, there was an attempt by Ugandan and, and Kenyan authorities to have a conversation about this matter. But you know, um, while Uganda asks Kenya to give a continuous flow of, of fuel, some of us have actually criticized the Ugandan authorities that um, the, the fuel storage capacity in Uganda is one of the 70s. In fact, the last one that Idi Amin completed, that is way be started by um, the first Obote government. So that is nearly 40 years old. So infrastructure issues, right now Ugandans are paying through their nose, but of course the government argues that it's really because about the war in Ukraine perhaps Kenya to an extent is generally true. But I think there is an element of political incompetence and a sense of impunity here. I'm trying to understand, sir, how far you, you talk about the relationship. You folks have uh, one of the strongest uh, socioeconomic relations on the African continent within the East African community. So this deal with Kenya to increase this uh, full supply quota to Uganda, how does it really work? I know currently Uganda is, pro is working very seriously on its own hydrocarbon, multi-billion dollars pipeline uh, oil and gas project. But on the other hand, the, the fuel that the common man needs to, to, uh, to, to power whatever and to move vehicles, automobiles and things like that, so how is the deal with Kenya being worked out? What's that relationship? Tell me more about it. I think this was an agreement which was, uh, okay, actually a request by Ugandan authorities to their Kenyan counterparts uh, uh, several weeks ago. I'm not quite sure whether there is any formal response. But as I say, even if the responses were there, um, Uganda structurally needs to be able to have the fuel that comes into Uganda, I mean, into Uganda from Kenya. And, uh, and if you like, um, storage. What Uganda is actually telling Kenya is that give us capacity, I think about 110 cubic uh, uh, meters of uh, fuel per, per month, you know, I guarantee that that flow will come from Mombasa. It will go onto the Kenyan uh, road and all rails, and real mainly roads, and then enter Uganda per month on average. But as I said, some of these are incidental and foreseeable. You know, Uganda used to use the main rail system, which is actually by and large collapse. So the rail system is not there. So it's basically trucks and trailers. A slight delay, a slight accident on the main road would, would block, you know, perhaps half the country's fuel capacity per day, as it were. So it's purely common sense. But that's why I'm saying while there is a political question, there is genuinely a, a structural challenge facing Uganda's fuel industry. But beyond that, actually, you know, because, again, of the weaknesses of our own transport infrastructure in places like Kampala, where you can spend four hours. Now, those are huge man hours per day on the road, on, in, on the road, basically merely in traffic because the infrastructure has not been worked on. It basically means that we have more cars, individuals using single cars, single vehicle cars. They're hardly any buses. They're hardly any trains, but they're not trains. So that means the demand is growing higher and higher and higher while their capacity to literally transport fuel from Mombasa 
to Kampala or indeed from Malaba border, which is basically my neighborhood with the Kenya, is really not sufficiently equipped for this day and age. Uh, so, in road infrastructure, and, and I was in, in, in Nairobi uh, a couple of months ago, towards the end of last year, and I see what's going on in terms of road infrastructure and a bit of all that. What are you folks doing in Uganda with this, the, the close, the, the very affinity, politically, socially, and otherwise, that you guys have? Why is that so difficult thing to do? It makes economic sense for me, by the way. I think no, it doesn't. And you're absolutely right. When you're in Nairobi, I think I really envy you, Bosom, because Nairobi is very different from Kampala. Traditionally, Nairobi has been the better capital uh, within the region. And yes, you're absolutely right. The East African community generally, which was traditionally Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, which is now extended to Rwanda, including DRS Congo, we are basically one family. But when you look at the economics of it, you know, until very recent, as I say, the, the, we had the rail network that started from Mombasa to Kampala and beyond Kampala to Kasese in the, in the Congolese border. The rail system in Uganda has by and large collapsed. So what you see in Nairobi is really not the realities in Uganda. And the other thing also, Kenyan, uh, after the, 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 the collapse of the Moe regime, you know, the, the, the political elite that emerged from there, these guys invested hugely uh, on in the infrastructure, both road and railways. But that ends at the Kenyan border. The system from, from uh, the border with, 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 uh, with Kenya, meaning Malaba or Busia, into Kampala, is not the same. There is no rail system. So, but anyway, let's say Uganda would generally argue anyway that they had um, some obstacles, both in Mombasa. There is global uh, challenges facing uh, um, the oil industry around the world. So that is basically fair enough. And with the current system, there's no justification anyway that because our rail systems are broke, so therefore we should not have the fuel flow. But as I say, even if we had the fuel flow, we just do not have sufficient storage capacity. It's basic economics. It's not A-level economics. It's not universal economics. It's primarily basic economics that you need to store to keep for emergencies. So as I say, a tiny little accident on the road, a delay for six hours will definitely have a dent on the system. So Ugandan system is, is, is a, one in which there is a huge demand for this fuel, uh, generally, in the economy, but very little in terms of the supply end. And when you go into some of the challenges that you see in the headlines, where we can't even organize a national hospital without controversies about investors in courts, those kind of things that you used to hear in Nigeria in the, in the 90s, which by and large, you guys are lucky, we've mo you've moved on. Those are the things which are actually facing Uganda. How it, we move on from here, I actually generally don't know. I think increasingly the, 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 the citizen run have been around in Kampala in the last several days. The, 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 the language and the, the tones I'm getting from the average citizen, particularly the imagined middle class Ugandans, are beginning to get rather jittery. And I really hope the political class will be taking it much more seriously this time. Uh, do you think there are fundamental structural issues for Uganda in terms of energy sufficiency, energy sustainability, the overall direction of the economy? Hmm. Um, I, I think you, Uganda has generally operated on the basis of, uh, um, of try and error, and today we'll justify what happens tomorrow. Going forward, anyway, we've got oil, which is coming up, and uh, there, there, there's work going on in oil, for, for in, 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 in oil investment in Uganda. And I think over the next uh, couple, couple of years, I think by 2025, we should be having our own big oil beginning to flow. So to an extent, there is hope there, but that is only purely oil. By and large, the oil that is going to be produced will not be sufficient to cater for our energy. Uh, we still need to invest in, in biogas. We still need to invest in uh, in 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 um, in um, uh, natural uh, oil, meaning I mean uh, natural fuel, including possibly make the best use of the sun, which we will have a lot of it here. So it's about a reorganization and a calibration of our economy. But beyond that, also talking about the economy, you know, we need to be able to afford this. <laughs> you know, the fact that actually we, we we produce oil does not necessarily mean that it's going to be free at the pump. You know, you can't is amongst the most expensive. As I said, I was going to look at the indices. Starting with Venezuela, you just envy these guys that maybe you want to have it every weekend to spend somewhere near Venezuela <laughs> compared to what's happening here, here in Uganda.
Okay, we will spend uh, some of, most of this conversation around fuel. I just want to ask the final one, just about a minute, about food. The World Food Organization, the United Nations, the FAO, the World Bank, the IMF, everybody's talking about the looming food crisis. Do you have, uh, have you had dinner tonight? It's later now already, so. No, uh, <laughs> are you all right? I, I was lucky to have dinner, but I can tell you that the dinner that I had, it was warmed thanks to a not very healthy way of using microwave. So most of what I had was um, cooked several days ago. But, you know, I passed by um, a part of Kampala, which is slightly less advantaged than uh, uh, some of us are. And you see people struggling. I can tell you three days ago, for the first time in a very long time, I, I saw faces not far away from where I live, where I had to let go of the bananas that, that I had um, uh, I bought for myself. Uh, to, 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 serve it, to serve particular individuals, meaning um, I think two, three, four, maybe up to three average rather poorly struggling families. So, yes, uh, food prices has more than doubled. Uh, I know people, including from some of the people from my family, who are attempting to run uh, small uh, uh, groceries and, 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 um, and, and shop, meaning mini supermarkets, and there is struggle. So there is huge, um, huge uh, skyrocketing on prices. One, that may be related in relation to fuel, and it's true that traders will tend to exploit these situations anyway, meaning that uh, they will either hoard or double the, the double the, the what double the um, the prices. But by and large, there is shortage. I visited eastern and part of northern Uganda, including going to the to bury our speaker that you had who passed away the other month. And you clearly look at this terrain, meaning rain failed in some places. Uh, um, in some other areas, people really have not been farming. But remember, particularly northern Uganda, uh, you know, northern and eastern Uganda, these are generally post-conflict emergent areas struggling with food. That said, Uganda, relative and compared to most other African countries, possibly including your own native Nigeria, when it comes, thankfully, to the weather and to the climate, we seem to be slightly better endowed. Mm. Had it been the case that most Ugandans depended on supermarkets, it would be a situation far worse than where we are at the moment. So it's really not looking very good. And final point I want to say, I have an average middle-class, decent, young professional lady who told me about a week ago that, you know, okay. these prices are getting high, mm. meaning she was struggling that much as you might have been joking whether or not I had dinner today. I suspect that lady about a, 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 okay. a week uh, ago was yeah. struggling to get... Uh, a meal for herself, and yes, she's a public servant. It could get really, really tough. Just such a chair, or just have a chair, the international journalist and political analyst in Kampala. Man, the next conversation we'll have will be about the Ugandan coffee. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Enjoy yourself, and see you next time on the show.